Right, clearly, <coughs> clearly this is a, a deep challenge, is getting people back from lunch uh, at all. Yeah. But I'm going to crack on, I've got... Somebody once said that the, the, the definition of film is 19 frames a second. Uh, and, and you might think that this presentation feels like a film when you've seen as many slides as I've got. But there's a lot of things to say around this. I want to talk about the, um, the experience we've had in the UK in opening up data. Both the, what it offers, which I'm sure many of you will be converts or need little persuasion of the power of open, after all given the conference you're attending, talk about what its promise is, where we think it's delivering value, what we're learning, and also be a bit honest about the perils, where the costs are, um, which I think uh, we can afford to talk about now that we are in a position where lots of people are, uh, are emulating or trying to start their own open government data initiatives. Now, Okay, who doesn't know this slide? Who doesn't know the earthquake story from Haiti? Hands up. Anybody here who doesn't know that story? Okay, a few. Okay, the, that's the amazing thing about ha, this audience. Most of you know this story. I was giving a talk at a conference on Monday of all the heads of all the national mapping agencies in the world. Ordnance Survey, Swiss Topo, you know, the people who are the chief executives of the mapping agencies, 60% of people in the room had not seen this example, which is, which is, I think, remarkable. Maybe it was just a skewed sample, who knows? Anyway, the fact is that in January, when the earthquake happened in Haiti, there were very imprecise maps of the uh, capital, Port-au-Prince. Using a combination of open data, open standards, open licenses, and open source, we went from this uh, situation here to this here, a detailed cartography in 14 days, okay? Now that is impressive to many people and shows the promise. In open government data, it took a bit longer than 14 days, but what we had in the UK was going from this situation here. This is a, um, a couple of guys, Gavin, a, a couple of guys at the Guardian building when we imagined early in, t well, late in 2009, what it would take to publish all the government data they had about a particular postcode, a zip code, a very small area, on average about 10 or so residences, houses. And we actually produced this thing called the postcode paper which was a lovely description of all the data that was held in government about the bus times, the travel timetables, the crime rates, where you could get allotments to grow your own vegetables, what the actual opening times of pharmacies and GP practices were. Useful stuff, actually. About well over half of the data in that paper that we produced would have been illegally republished at that point. Okay? And so the shift from the illegal to something we were rather proud of, and that's the old interface, as you will see, you know, with the original RDF logo, um, in three months. And how did that happen? Well, it actually happened, and you wouldn't be surprised because of all of these good things. I'll talk about them a little bit. Open data, open, 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 open. But it happened through groundwork, people, technology, and a powerful idea. We wouldn't have got where we had got in the UK today if we hadn't had work like the Power of Information Review that people like Tom Steinberg and Ed Mayo uh, inputted to in 2007. We wouldn't have gotten there if we didn't have the Open Knowledge Foundation already doing stuff in technology and tooling and cataloging. But we also, in the UK, uh, we had a project that we'd run, actually, with the Office of Public Sector Information and a bunch of public sector bodies in 2005. It was a project that I was involved with, John Sheridan. It was a research, my research group at Southampton. We showed the art of the possible in linking data together using some standards. They happened to be linked data standards, URI standards at the time, and show what the art of the possible was. That was groundwork. But it took uh, more than that. Also, it was a powerful idea. So everybody's seen examples like the cholera mashup from the 19th century or releasing the bicycle accident data. 
you need a powerful story or set of stories to get people to understand the value of taking data and integrating it. All known in this audience, absolutely. It needed a top-down approach. So we were lucky in our first attempt to have the Prime Minister of the day, Gordon Brown, supporting this. Remarkably in the UK, we've actually still got top-level support, partly because the narrative around being transparent and open for a variety of reasons is very powerful. Most, well, and an opportunity here is that just recently our Chancellor is telling us that it now it's going to be a basis of economic growth. Right. Well, for all the other good things we do, open data, it's now going to generate economic value. Now, that presents us with both an opportunity and a set of challenges because we're being allowed to do this collectively around the world at different levels and the variety of reasons that we have uh, will appear to be many and varied. I'll talk about them. You've got to be top down, you've got to be bottom up. So this is the Mad With Data. This is, this is, these are groups of activists, much of many of you in this room, who simply get hold of the data and do stuff with it. And we also need a middle out cadre of people. We need people, and I don't mean to embarrass them, but I'll just show you. There's two of them, James Forrester, John Sheridan, people who work inside government at the middle tier, the people who can actually connect the aspirations of the top with the activism at the bottom. Now that's the particular mix of fortunate circumstances we had in the UK. Um, we had a race that helped and we've got a bigger race now. So when we started back in 2005, nobody really cared actually. <laughs> um, Obama's presentation of um, the first directive on open data, open government helped in 2009. We got appointed in 2000, later in 2009, and then there's this kind of sense of, we're going to put more data out there than you, we're going to do more interesting things with it. A race to the top never hurts. And now, it's working at all levels, as we know. Not just nation states, but regions and cities. And indeed, all around the world. And indeed, you have to kind of keep a register of these things, which OKF does just to keep a track of the catalogues that are appearing. And this is just breeding a competitive environment of good ideas and sharing best practice that is extremely powerful. Now, for those who haven't heard the reasons why you do it, they are various. And any one of your organizations or people you're trying to persuade will believe some of these and not others, or prioritize some in favor of others. Accountability can be a difficult thing for governments not least when you start to show how much senior officials are paid, for example, which is a kind of open data. Or you start to see where the money is spent at a very local, fine grain level. It can be about economic value, innovation and growth. And we see this again with the spending data that was released in the UK. Companies coming along and beginning to build tools on top that they sell back, value-added services, smart procurement, if this council buys or this regional authority buys pencils at this rate from this supplier, why are they being charged something different in this other authority from the same supplier? All these inequalities, which interestingly, businesses make great margins out of differential pricing, when it's clearly obvious, there will be a gain and a loss. Efficient for government, profit margins disappearing for, <laughs> for companies. So you will expect that the economic valuation has this rather complex and interesting set of trade-offs. Improving public services, again, a narrative for many governments or regions is you put the data out there, it just makes things better. Again, many of you will, this will be uh, absolute um, um, in your DNA, but it's worth saying that, for example, in the health service in the United Kingdom, uh, whatever else, as they begin to publish things like hospital infection rates, so how many people get a hospital-acquired infection. Or indeed in one group, a bunch of clinicians decided to publish their, their rates of success in cardiology, heart surgery. And the open publication of that data actually drove up performance across the sector in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, we'll come on to crime shortly. That's an interesting other domain. domain. As we know, you publish and you get people collaborating with you to either give you more information about the data you can't, find, can't get or find it hard to get, 
or indeed improving your existing stock of data. And the argument, you get more for less, whether it's energy utilization in government buildings or just people turn up that bit more on time, not having to hang about for their trains in the tube stations of the United Kingdom or London. This is something that allows application developers to build tools that save people time, make them more efficient, optimize their behavior. And the civil value thing, to, not to forget that, one of the big drivers is to simply allow us to understand how social capital can be increased, how we can make it safer for cyclists, how we can make it actually safer for people to walk the streets or avoid the problems where they might be, and so on. So lots of powerful reasons. And my, uh, my, my, my takeaway for you from this is that don't rely on one, that it will depend on who you're talking to if you're trying to convince a skeptical data owner or somebody for whom you want to kind of engage with building an application, their particular priority list will vary at any particular time. Now, the claim also is that if you build, if you release the data, the apps will come. They do, and the hard thing for government to accept is that in this world, it isn't the best guess or the best provider of the applications. And we've seen that repeatedly in the UK with the applications that are there. And the other tough thing, though, for governments is to actually get them to publish data that matters. There are a, quite a lot of catalogues out there where the data is of no particular interest to anybody at all. It's a republication of particular official statistics. There's no reason why you shouldn't start with that. But actually, people want actionable information. They want information that makes a difference, whether it's about spending or where the bus stops are or indeed whether to switch the lights off in their place of work to improve their energy consumption, publish data that matters. And recently in the UK, the crime data that was published every month in England and Wales, 49 police forces publish the crime that's occurred each month, more or less where it occurred and its category. Now this is powerful and indeed if you're bolder about this, and we all know the various experiments that have been underway uh, in various cities, if you publish exact detail on some crime types, you can, for example, notice whether it's associated with other behavior or other circumstances. Now, the trade-off here, of course, is between anonymity, victim identification, and the public good. But as we begin to see in the UK, this really does start to drive general behavior in interesting ways. And in fact, it's not just the official sites that publish this. We now have handheld mobile apps to give you a sense of what the situation is like in the place you currently live. And I will just tip a, a, a respectful hat to our most recent data release in the UK, which is the wiring diagram for British government and associated uh, bodies. All of UK government now the civil service organization charts are published. They're published using linked data standards. More of that in a minute. Um, and they, they're really quite detailed. They'll tell you exactly how much a particular person at this grade here is paid in the Department of Health, what their email is, what their telephone number is. This is data that matters. And actually, in the way it's published, it becomes re, uh, much more maintainable. Maintaining the flow of data is a key feature in all of this. It's easy for governments to think they've done enough at a certain point and to always be able to drive it. To recognize that all of this data that you're releasing has a tail. It is a long tail. Unsurprisingly, like everything we know about activity on the web, some data is massively used by very many people. And you will not be surprised, and many of you will live in the air in the space of transport data is a great example, or the, when I talk about location data. But some data has marginal utility to perhaps only a small community. Our view, of course, is that you should publish the stuff anyway. And the long tail, actually, a lot of people ultimately are under this curve here and will be using data sets at a level that you'll hardly be able to observe but will nevertheless be of value to them. So, publish data that matters, but actually 
get yourself to a position where you're publishing data routinely, that's the kind of behavior change we're looking to engender in our governments, in our cities, in our regions. In the UK, we've always taken a view that this is just not a technology project. And I think Andrew Stott, who's talking later, will talk about this in some detail. We aren't just building another technology platform. In fact, policy is key. And one of the things that we are uh, importantly driving in the UK are what we call the public data principles. And this is some of them. And you know, they're at the level of what the assumption is about how you should publish, whether it should be ultimately perfect data. No, publish it when it's getting it out quickly trumps accuracy in, in general. Okay, now then there are people who in the Office of National Statistics who worry about these claims, but you can make interesting arguments about why, and we're quite used to this in some domains, you can expect data to improve as it's released over uh, longer periods of time, but getting them to release it in the first place. Of course, we'll talk about this a little bit in a machine readable form and so on. The same open license, and you will know and we believe that the slightest restriction on your licensing will kill reuse. Okay. We'll kill it dead in ways that the data owners just do not get. Okay. And whether it's Europeana that has removed the kind of ability to not be able to charge commercial uh, income for reusable cultural content, or whatever your domain is, when you see the barriers taken out, the adoption becomes much more universal and thorough. And the OGL, the Open Government License, interesting history behind that about why we, you know, it's uh, Commons compliant up to some point, but why actually it helped for us to have a license rooted in the common law of our country to actually build on and that the lawyers helped us develop. Very important. Okay, and this, the journey to stardom, this idea of formats matter, of course. Um, and we know that many of you will be entirely content if you've got structured machine readable data that, that has a clear semantics. But I would urge everyone on this journey to ask themselves, if you don't go the whole linked data route, at least think about designing web addresses for your data. Okay, so URLs, URIs to identify things. And when we did this in the UK, when we have done it, it started to build a reusable infrastructure that links across our data sets. So this is the postcode data. Remember when I first showed you the slide of the newspaper that had a postcode on the front, because what it did was take all the data about that postcode and republish it at that point illegally. The bloody postcode wasn't even available, as many as you know, okay? Was not available to, for free reuse. Well, there, is, there it is, it's now available indeed URIs for our administrative geography are one of the things that are the most widely and usefully, potentially usefully usable parts of our open data journey. I say potentially because even when you have provided these things, it's hard to get other data users to notice to use them. Okay, so there is a real issue about constantly educating and getting people to notice that actually we've got URIs for schools. Okay, here's a URI for the Greycoats Hospital School in London. We have them for government posts. That's the Director General, a URI. You know, this web address here is that persistent identifier for that post in government as long as it exists. Or ministers, our current Home Secretary, Theresa May. Or bus stops, or, and the point about designing your URIs to withstand organizational change, to act as focus points for information integration, I would argue is one of the things we have really learned in our open government data journey. Because, you know, whether, you, whether you're a researcher who wants to join up these various uh, components using fancy services such as same as or backlinking services or geographic inclusion services it really helps to have URIs whether they're from DBpedia or whether they're from your national mapping agency 
to make the equivalences, to link across, to join up the resources, to enrich. Because as we get government to publish data in this way, enrichment becomes possible. And again, people in this room, Chris Bitzer, his team, other people, are all about trying to build an environment where this cloud of open data means that government publishing stuff over here gets added enrichment from other resources which are available using these standard representational formats. I've been talking for about 20 minutes, okay? Or how long, do you think? Well, you can wrap it up in three minutes. In three minutes? Well, I'm gonna talk about perils now. Yeah, okay, and take some questions. I, th I think it's important we also understand that there are costs of all of this. There are costs for government and costs for us as a community. Actually, one interesting question about maintaining large amounts of data inventory as a government is where do you store it? Who's going to bear the cost of storing it? Um, does it live in the cloud? How do you access it? Um, how do you keep it current? There is, in our data liberation world, a real cost of support here. There is an issue around quality. We know about this. We can make a virtue out of it. We know when we get the data back from from government, it's wrong, and this community has done great work in showing how he can use other open resources to improve. So the 18,000 missing bus stops got corrected in the UK pretty fast. Um, hugely valuable, but I'll come back to that. There's this issue. You've got to educate both yourselves and ourselves and the wider community that this isn't a problem that actually contesting the interpretation of data will actually, you'll be argued about this. People will come up to you and say, you can't release this data, people might misinterpret it. Well, our press does that all the time. <laughs> My favorite example is this one, the date, well, is it the Mail Online? There's a surprise. An English newspaper which claimed that the UK is the most overpopulated country in Europe. Well, if you don't take out all the water that covers Holland, it is. But if you do, it isn't. And Contesting that assertion is a really interesting piece of the um, educational literacy we need around data. There are issues around security and privacy. There really are in publishing this stuff, whether it's you know, AIS, which tells you where all the ships are, which is not an open government initiative, but whether it's around publishing all that crime data, because it is the case that increasingly information triangulation Having all this non-personal public data exquisitely defines your postcode, where you live, your habits, your susceptibilities, your demographic. And I think, for me, it's all about trying to be legally agile and understanding how we respond, not just to give up on privacy, but to understand how to re-secure our fundamental interest in privacy in an age of open data. They're not inconsistent in my view at all. Right, last slides. There's more to come. There's more to come in the UK and elsewhere, everywhere of course, and there'll be some quite interesting announcements in the UK uh, in the next week or so. You must go and fight for your location data wherever and however it occurs, because all those hands that went up at the conference at the beginning of the week to say they hadn't heard of the Haiti example, 75% of them, when they were asked whether there was more upside in open data than downside, more opportunity than threat, and these are the heads of the national mapping agencies, 75% put their hand up and said there was more upside. So why aren't they releasing it? Okay. Um, how can we take them on the journey that allows them to release at least enough of it, either as a canton or a lander or a region or a city or a government, so that we can do the kind of mashup we can now do in the UK, which takes a postcode, shows me the crime rates around it, the correlated outer ring of crime rates, gives me a sense of context and qualification. You'll see in the UK a move to my data. For you open Easters in the audience, think about the next target of your interest, all those businesses that hold data about you who should be providing it back to you in a machine-readable standard format for you to decide what to do with. It's not all about government. There are entitlements in this space that the business world hold. And I think as you get data back, actually there's a real win for business in the new, richer kind of dialogue that exists 
between you and the uh, state or the business world. I don't think we've worked yet the whole process of how to do Open Government 2.0. And this is the challenge that we're working out how to publish it out. We even see examples of acquiring and enhancing it. But how do you write it back to government so that government can take this data set or someone can take this data set as authoritative and base decisions on it in, a, um, in an appropriate way? Um, I'm not going to say anything more than that. Uh, it isn't just about being another IT project, and I think uh, that's no surprise to you. Um, but I would say that we do need to think, if we're going to engage the power of the crowd, and this is my favorite example at the moment, the one um, in, uh, in the UK, where they're taking old ship logs, captain ship logs, from the 19th, 18th century, Captains knew where they were on those ships, and they recorded pressure and temperature very accurately, the weather. It's a great resource for getting people to add to our understanding, in that case, of open data for climatology. But how we do that, science is just struggling with this notion of how we take common contributions back into scientific stewardship. How do we do it with government, cities, regions, um, is a challenge. So thank you very much. Thank you. We started late, and I did have half an hour. Yes, um, please. Is this on? Yeah. How getting the data out in some sort of form and then cleaning it up by the community is kind of working quite well. But yeah. of course, it's collected in the wrong way with no yeah. ontologies, different departments doing totally different things, yeah. tied to internal IT contracts. Yeah. What's the progress in changing that? Because it seems to me that the problem with, with the UK government is, in fact, it's populated by people who, most of who do not understand IT, and their whole structure of solving that has been to contract everything out. And so there isn't the critical <laughs> mass in-house to be able to... They don't know what ontology means, most of them. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm controlled vocabulary. Yeah, or whatever you yeah. use whatever, to, not, whatever. to not frighten structure. the horses yeah. too much. Mm. No, they don't. And I think... There is a peculiar problem around having to re-explain to certain senior officials what is advantageous about a standard format for import and export. Yeah. Um, what is being done about that? I think, I mean, again, we're trying to promote the pockets of excellence and understanding to clone out that understanding at least enough that people understand there's a benefit. I mean, we are also, I think, government has not yet understood that the real beneficiary of open data could be itself. Okay. And I think, um, will they put the effort in? Um, we always talk, I mean, we're under a resource-constrained uh, period in our economic history. Um, the general tradition and background of people recruiting these posts is not particularly IT literate. Um, and the few people who do have this sensitivity and understanding are very thinly spread. Um, I think we, although we would like to institutionalize the process of making transparency the norm, there was something really great when uh, Tim and I and Andrew and others started the project in that we were allowed to be very agile and just float about, almost red teaming it. But as soon as something gets big enough, the red team model tends to just get you know, there's all sorts of talks in the UK about skunk works, alpha works, all sorts of new ways of commissioning systems. But spreading the ability where you can insert people to help people understand the process is difficult. Having said that, John Sheridan, a great example with the organogram work, has provided the tooling that allows people to certainly write out um, the data in a very straightforward way. So there's a big tooling job to do here as well as education. I've got to finish now. I'm going to take one more question. I'm just going to override. One more question. There must be one more question. I, then I've had half an hour, and I feel my contract is done. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a way to uh, uh, Do you think there's a way to uh, create a law that uh, forces government to uh, release the information in a... 
Yeah, law, law, legislation. A big, 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 big question. Um, we would prefer, where possible, not to legislate. Uh, legislation doesn't have the greatest history. Um, it usually doesn't frame quite the problem you want framed and doesn't lead to the behavior you like. I mean, classically, PSI, freedom of information, they're there, but not in the way intended often. Um, so we actually generally believe that it's about trying to show the undoubted benefits before you legislate. Some areas you may have to, OK? Um, and in fact, there are enhancements to the freedom of information legislation in the UK going through to do simple things like allowing me, if I get the information back from government, to republish it. Yeah, I mean, sit or, yeah. So I think there are modifications. Um, Generally, I'd prefer to work by, um, by, by collaboration. Uh, the PSI directive modification will be another example where maybe specifics around the nature of the format of reuse can be helpful. Um, in the UK, they're talking about it. We're talking about a right to data. We are talking about it, but understanding what it needs to be so that it is actually legislation that gets used is, is another thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Give it up for Professor Chetpool.